Ăn tiếng Ăn tiếng thì Ngủ à Ra ra phụ bắn Hồi hồi chị 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 chứ qua là hơi chị em mới ăn xó sao không biết Thôi là sướng quá hả Rồi, qua đường thì coi nha, sợ không thấy, không sợ thấy nhỏ không khó thấy nữa chứ Vì mà xem được thì xem, hả? Nhưng mà xem Sợ em khó thấy, có nghĩa là nó, nó em, em thấy to được, cái sợ thấy nhỏ em thấy nó hơi mờ mờ đó, khó thấy á Có gì thì phấn to lên xem Nó vẫn có phấn to được cho em á
năm sao quyết tập thì nó múa cho vui chứ nam có một lần nữa. dù như hôm nay mà không đặt đặt múa lăng múa lăng trong được chứ múa cho nó vui em cái đường mình không có múa lăng gì hết chị 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 ơi chứ qua là hơi chị em mới ăn sớm sao không biết ừ, sướng quá hả Rồi, coi được thì coi nha sợ không thấy không sợ thấy nhỏ không khó thấy đâu chứ về mà xem được thì xem hả nhưng mà xem sợ em khó thấy có nghĩa là nó nó em thấy to được cái sợ thấy nhỏ em thấy nó hơi mà mà nó khó thấy á có gì thì phấn to lên xem nó vẫn có phấn to được cho em á
Honda's next electric vehicle will be a plug-in hydrogen fuel cell CRV. We've gotten used to unusual-looking electric vehicles from Honda, thank you, Honda Clarity, so we were surprised to learn that Honda's next green mobile will be based on that most conventional of conventional SUVs, its latest CRV. Oh, but if you're thinking that means there will be nothing unusual, you are wrong, ladies and gentlemen, meet Honda's plug-in fuel cell CRV due for introduction in 2024. By the way, that's a regular version of the new CRV in the photos, but we don't expect the fuel cell version to look too much different. For those unfamiliar, a fuel cell electric vehicle, FCEV, works by running hydrogen from onboard storage tanks and oxygen from the air through a device called a fuel cell stack. The hydrogen and oxygen combine to form water, a process that produces electricity, which is used to power an onboard electric motor that moves the car. The water dribbles out of the FSEV's tailpipe. The stack replaces the battery in a regular, plug-in EV, so, instead of charging the car, you fill it up with hydrogen, sort of like how you put gas in your regular car. Other recent FSEVs include Toyota's Mirai sedan, the Hyundai Nexo SUV, and Honda's now discontinued Clarity fuel cell, above, red. Haven't heard of them? That's because they mostly were limited to Southern California, the only part of the country with even a nascent hydrogen refueling infrastructure. We have quite a bit of experience with FSEVs, having just spent a year with the 2021 Toyota Mirai. Our biggest complaint was, shocker, that minuscule refueling infrastructure, which wasn't helped by stations that were broken or out of fuel. We saw improvements during our year with the car, but still regarded the fueling technology as not quite ready for prime time. And, again, you can't really leave California. Honda has found a way to address, most of, that, and that's where the unusual plug-in part comes in. Existing FSEVs have a small battery that works as a buffer, absorbing excess power produced by the stack and providing extra power for acceleration, much like the battery in a non-plug-in hybrid, but, again, it's juiced solely by the onboard fuel cell stack. The fuel cell CRV will have a larger battery, one that can be plugged in and charged from an external source, just like a plug-in gas-electric hybrid such as the Toyota Prius Prime or, defunct, Chevy Volt. Actually, that analogy works perfectly, the plug-in FCEV is to existing FSEVs what plug-in hybrids are to standard hybrids. While Honda hasn't made any announcements about battery-only range, we would imagine it would have to be enough to power the car for several miles, just like a PHEV. Incidentally, Honda is not the first to develop this technology, last year Stellantis announced a plug-in FCEV commercial van for Europe but Honda will be the first to sell it in North America. As former FCEV drivers, we see several advantages. There was at least one occasion when broken hydrogen stations and low fuel forced us to park the Mirai for several days, the ability to plug it in would have kept us on the move, and allowed us to drive to a working station that was farther away. We often lamented that the Mirai's small battery meant it couldn't store much energy from regenerative braking in mountain driving. And our experience with gasoline FEVs clues us into what may be the plug-in FSEV's biggest advantage. If the hydrogen CRV has a decent battery-only range, drivers who plug in nightly and whose daily driving requirements encompass a limited radius might need scarcely any hydrogen at all. Of course, we're also a bit dismayed, because the use of a hydrogen fuel cell renders the electric Honda CRV useless for most Americans. Of the 50-odd public hydrogen fueling stations currently operating in the U.S., all but one are in California, the Straggler is in Hawaii, on the Big Island, of all places. While the idea of a plug-in FCEV CRV will no doubt appeal to Californians frustrated with their Clarities, Mirais, and Nexos, it's not going to do much to forward the march of EVs across the nation, let alone hydrogen fuel cell options. We asked Honda's executives if they had any plans to help expand the national hydrogen fueling network, and got a non-answer in return. The CRV will be built at the Honda's Performance Manufacturing Center in Ohio, same place that makes the Acura NSX, so they'll presumably need hydrogen somewhere in that area, 
unless that plug-in aspect will help get newly built CR-Versus onto the transport trailers. Right now, the bulk of the new stations are being opened by a company called True Zero, which has its hands full debugging and upgrading the stations in California. Last we checked, there are no immediate plans for public hydrogen filling stations outside of the Golden State's borders. Honestly, the arrival of the FCE VCRV is a bit of a puzzle to us, because Honda has a battery-powered SUV coming around the same time, the 2024 Prologue, the first Honda product of the company's EV partnership with General Motors. And, of course, there's the lovely little Honda E, deemed too small for the US market. Honda is also working on solid-state batteries, which promise big increases in energy density, more power in a smaller package, though that technology is still a few years away from its retail debut. Our best guess is that the FCE VCRV is more of a test bed to give Honda more real-world data in its long-term quest to foist hydrogen to the fore. In Japan, the government is putting influence and money behind the hydrogen infrastructure, but the United States is betting on batteries. We see hydrogen's future in big trucks, since it solves the problem of them having to carry big, heavy battery packs, and we know Honda agrees. Still, having rather enjoyed the concept of our Mirai, electric car quietness and cleanliness with gasoline-like fueling speed, and seeing the advantages of a plug-in battery, we think Honda's plug-in fuel cell CRV will be an interesting new take on the technology. We'll learn more details about the vehicle closer to its launch in 2024. Hyundai, Nissan rollout services to make it easier to own an EV. Hyundai Home is a new online service the automaker is providing to electric vehicle customers to help them find local contractors to install EV home chargers, solar panels, and maybe a home battery. Nissan also announced EV Carefree Plus at the LA Auto Show. This is a collection of services including free public charging and roadside assistance to reduce anxiety in new EV drivers. Automakers have been experimenting with different ways of encouraging EV adoption with projects like this. GM, for example, will pay to have L2 home chargers installed when someone buys a new Bolt, and many automakers work with Kmerit to find reliable local contractors. Hyundai is working on making it easier for car buyers to choose a plug-in vehicle with a new program called Hyundai Home. The new website, which was announced today at the Los Angeles Auto Show, acts like an intermediary between someone who just purchased a new Hyundai EV and the boring nuts and bolts of getting a home charger permitted and installed and maybe filing for some local government or utility incentives. The Hyundai Home Marketplace uses your home address to find EV-related services available there. In my case, I was able to see options for rooftop solar and home battery storage, but the EV home charger section was not yet operational. Requesting information about rooftop solar brings up a personalized but auto-generated estimate of the lifetime savings of installing solar panels. The Home Energy Storage tab works similarly, providing an estimate of how much it would cost you to install enough batteries to power your home for a week. All of these estimates get refined by an actual installer or contractor once you complete the forms on the website, and the marketplace ends up providing customers with three bids for each project they might be interested in. Hyundai Home also offers human energy advisors who can answer questions about the technologies involved. Hyundai first announced the Hyundai Home project at the 2021 LA show and has partnered with Electrum to make it operational. The site currently works in 16 states, but nationwide operation is coming soon. Other companies at work on EV logistics. Hyundai has company when it comes to offering EV shoppers help getting set up for home charging. GM will cover the installation of Level 2 charging outlet for new Bolt EV or Bolt EUV customers, for example, and works with Kmerit to find verified installers. Automakers including Audi, BMW, and Cadillac all work with Kmerit to find local electricians for their customers, and Kmerit also offers home charger installation help for people who didn't just buy their EV at a dealership. Another new EV benefits program was announced alongside the Hyundai house at the LA show. 
Nissan announced a care initiative called EV Carefree Plus that will provide EV transition assistance to Aria and Leaf buyers, as well as customers of future Nissan electric vehicles. EV Carefree Plus is the branded name for some services Nissan was already offering, like an 8 year 100 mile battery warranty in roadside assistance, along with some complimentary public charging with EVGO and included scheduled maintenance for 3 years or 36,000 miles. Nissan also partners with Comerit for home charger installations. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Is this beautiful concept with butterfly doors the Mazda Miata EV? Mazda today teased a sports car concept called the Vision Study Model that we hope hints at a future Miata EV. The beautiful coupe concept features butterfly doors, bulging fenders, and proportions that appear Miata-esque. The Vision Study Model was shown as part of Mazda's presentation on its updated electrification plans through 2030. The thought of an all-electric Mazda Miata might peeve purists, but there will surely come a day when it's a reality. While it's still too soon to say when the first MX-5 EV will arrive, Mazda today revealed a three-phase strategy that prioritizes electrification leading up to 2030. Along with its updated plans, the company teased the Vision Study Model, a stunning coupe concept that we hope previews the future design of the iconic two-seater sports car. Last year, Mazda confirmed to car and driver that the next-generation Miata will be electrified in some way. We expect that to mean some sort of hybrid setup, which corresponds with part of the company's second phase. However, we wouldn't be surprised to see a fully electric Miata by the end of the decade. We also wouldn't be shocked to see an EV version that looks similar to the concept shown in press images as well as in clips of the video on Mazda's official YouTube channel. The concept first appears at the 34,55 mark. In the minutes leading up to the concept's first appearance, we see numerous shots of people happily driving different Miata generations, which further fuels our speculation that there's a connection between past MX-5s and the Vision Study model. Our first look at the concept is viewed through an iPhone screen, with its exposed chassis featuring what appears to be a T-shaped battery pack. The car's body then drops on top and we see its passenger side butterfly door open up. While the crazy doors are one of the concept's defining features, we don't expect them to be part of a production model. We do expect future Miatas to maintain a convertible body style, although a fixed roof variant like the concept wouldn't be a first, as Mazda did offer the rare JDM only and B generation coupe. The rest of the imaginary sports car looks doable, albeit ultra dramatic. Its wide hips, peaked front fenders, and low cowl are all exaggerated traits of the current ND Miata. The illuminated Mazda logo mounted low on the concept's nose and the slim, protruding front lighting elements are other neat touches. Of course, we realize Mazda's vision study model might not preview a future Miata EV at all. We have flashbacks of the visually arresting four-door Vision Coupe concept the company revealed back in 2017 that has not come to fruition. However, its aspirational styling did go on to influence the brand's design language, so perhaps the Miata-esque concept will do the same. At least we can dare to dream. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Video, it's hard to believe the 2023 Chevrolet Corvette Z06 exists. We knew the 2023 Chevrolet Corvette Z06 would be special. But even living with a regular C8 Corvette for a year and a little over 40,000 miles didn't adequately prepare us for how special. We learned that after spending a day at Grattan Raceway and testing both a convertible Z06 and a coupe Z06 equipped with the Z07 package for this video. What's it like driving a Z06 on track? As it turns out, you spend quite a bit of time with your mouth hanging open as that 5.5-liter V8 spins toward 8,600 RPM, making 670 horsepower in that intoxicating flat-plane crank howl. It's a good thing the car handles so well, too, because you want to get back to the front straight quickly if only so you can hear it again and again. 
we tested both a convertible Z06 and a coupe equipped with the high-performance Z07 package. You've likely already read those test results. If you haven't, go click the related links below. We'll wait. This video shows the differences between the two vehicles, though scheduling conflicts and limited access to the coupe prevented us from filming that car on track. We also provide added explanation as to why we couldn't match Chevy's skid pad lateral G claim on our skid pad. That answer involves diving into the owner's manual, which actually has instructions on how owners can prepare their Z06S for tracks like Virginia International Raceway and the Nürburgring, going as far as to recommend different tire pressure and aerodynamic configurations. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. The recent unveilings of all-terrain sports cars like the Porsche 911 Dakar and the Lamborghini Huracan Dorado had us thinking about what other likely candidates in the mid- and rear-engine category might choose to battle these two in the dirt, sand, and mud. The first thing that came to mind was an American mid-engine car, the long-awaited C8 Corvette. In road-going form it's an incredible performer, at its price point, and well beyond, that has truly impressed us. To imagine the C8 Corvette as a dirt-flinging, mud-slinging, rally-style vehicle, we turn to an AI image generator to rapid prototype a few ideas. These AI image generators scan, combine, remix, and reimagine thousands of images to try and closely match a human input prompt. We changed the requested backgrounds and asked for some additional detail in a few of our prompts but we otherwise let the AI try to come up with its own interpretation of what we're, mostly, jokingly calling a Corvette ZR2. The AI has some serious limitations, with some nonsensical details and absurd, or impossible, features, but if you think of them like a rough concept sketch it's easier to see the big picture idea. And some of these ideas are very compelling. We haven't heard any rumors about GM considering such a vehicle but perhaps the Dakar and Sterado might prompt some internal discussion. We certainly hope so. Lamborghini Huracan Sterado Review, Wild Thing Sterado It's one of those wonderful, not quite translatable Italian words. Similar to Countach, a Piedmontese expression that's a cross between holy cow and something a bit bluer. Sterado, then, in the broadest sense, means dirt road but Sterado is more like an unplowed field. It's untamed, unconquered. In English we might say the back 40. As you might know, San Agata Bolognese, the rural town where Lamborghini's HQ sits, is farm country. Ferruccio Lamborghini made his first fortune building tractors. Most of the roads around San Agata are Sterados. What this has to do with a 630 horsepower Mars Attack Rover, I will leave up to you, dear reader. If nothing else, it's a fun word to say. Sterato. As has now become something of a tradition, Lamborghini's head of engineering, Maurizio Reggiani, flew yours truly and just three other journalists to southern Italy for less than 48 hours to sample his team's latest prototype. The first time Reggiani convened this foursome, we drove the $2 million Centenario, then we drove the eventual best driver's car winning Huracan Performante. Next came the quickest SUV motor trends ever tested, the Urus. And now this, a heavily modified off-road supercar that, as of this moment in time, may or may not go into production. I'm probably stating the obvious, but this last car is the craziest yet. Also, I sure hope I keep getting invites to test drive top secret lumbos. My 12 year old self is plotzing. What on earth is the Sterato? When Reggiani's team was developing the Urus, it spent a great deal of time off roading. Having worked on nothing but super sports cars, as Lamborghini insists on calling its products in an odd callback to the Winkleman era, driving on dirt was totally new to them. They fell in love. And then one of them asked, what if? What if they could jack up a Huracan, in this case, the new Huracan Evo, mount massive balloon tires underneath, reprogram the computers for off-road duty, and armor plate it? I've long maintained that a proper SUV must look one of two ways, 
like something General Patton would use to invade Palermo or like a moon buggy. If we ever go to war on the moon, I know what the Third Army's command vehicle will look like. So again, what is it? A Huracan Evo, for sure. One that's been raised nearly two inches, 47 millimeters, and had its track widened by over an inch, 30 millimeters. The Sterados wheel arches are both wider and 3D printed to accommodate the wider balloon tires, currently unnamed prototype off-road rubber by Pirelli, I suggested D0, for Dirt 0, 235-45 or 20 front and 305-40 or 20 rear. The middle number on a standard Urankin Evo is 30 front, 30 rear. Remember, that number is the aspect ratio, not an actual measurement, meaning the Sterato's front sidewall is 45% of the 235 mm width, or approximately 4 inches of sidewall. Quite unusual these days. Especially on a supercar. The front axle has been moved forward 3 inches to accommodate the larger tires which necessitated not only new control arms but also longer front fenders. Aluminum armor plating has been added to the bottom of the Sterato's snout, its side sills, and under the rear fascia. That rear hunk of metal also acts as a diffuser, because Lamborghini. The approach angle is increased by just 1 degree, while the departure angle increases by 6.5 degrees. However, several engineers assured me that in all their testing, the only part of the nose that scrapes is the armor. There's also shielding in front of the side intakes to keep rocks and debris out of the engine's intake plenums. LED running lights, an LED light bar, and mud flaps complete the Mad Max supercar look. Expect to also see a ski-slash-snowboard-slash-surfboard rack if and when the Sterato reaches production. Maybe some spikes, too. The interior is quite cool, with military drab green Alcantara covering the seats, set off by orange accents. The aluminum plates in place of floor mats are a great touch. Personally, I'd ditch the harnesses, but I hate harnesses in street cars. Normally I'm against half cages, two, full cage or go home, but I think this one has the effect of greatly stiffening the Sterato. The final piece of the Sterato puzzle is the reprogrammed LDVI. Launched with the Evo, the Lamborghini Dinamica Vehicle Integrata, i.e., Lamborghini Dynamic Vehicle Integration, here on the Sterato is geared, pun intended, toward off-road fun. First, the entire system has been optimized for low-grip surfaces and situations. Not just the ESC but the systems that dole out torque front and rear plus side to side have been Sterato tuned with dusty, gravelly roads in mind. As such, the Sterato exhibits more rear drive behavior than any other Lamborghini, even the RWD Huracan. I know, I know, but it's true. When you're entering a slide or even in a slide, torque is doled out in such a way as to maximize the slide. Why on earth not? First up was the Nardo handling circuit, the best track you've never driven. It's hard to stress just how wonderful its 16 turns are. Not surprisingly, here's where the Sterato's Huracan bones emerged. The thing is a joy to drive on track. First of all, it leans. The suspension's been softened considerably compared to a standard Evo, let alone a Performante. I'm not saying the Sterato is floppy in corners. I hate that. Rather, it takes a set as you turn, which I love. Leaning into a turn gives you a better sense of what the car is doing. Is it the quickest way around a track? No, obviously not. However, because practically every other supercar on earth is engaged in a race with no end to churn out the quickest lap time, to me it's big time refreshing to pilot one that's more interested in having a great time. Also, with the traction control off, the already rear-biased Sterato starts torquing. Fine by me. When I drove the Urus prototypes at the Nardo Center last year, we tested what would become the world's quickest SUV on both the aforementioned track and a fast, winding dirt track, similar to a rally stage, called Strata Bianco, the White Road. With the Urus, I was pleased that an SUV did so well in the dirt, 
but I found myself shocked at how well the big gal handled herself on the track. The reverse is true and then some for the Sterato. I was gobsmacked sideways by just how incredible this post-apocalyptic looking buggy did in the dirt. I perhaps forgot that the Sterato still has that incredible 5.2 liter V10 and a quick shifting dual clutch transmission. There are two places on Strata Bianco where I was able to pull third gear, and I was shocked by not only the acceleration but also the velocity. Just ferocious. Strata Bianco is maybe two cars wide and lined with trees. Frightening at first, but then just stupid piles of fun. As I got on the brakes, way too early at first, I must add, any steering input at all sent the rear of the car into a drift, exactly the way the LDVI was programmed to do. Why do you want the rear end to move? You ever watched a rally? Getting rotated before the turn is half the fun. Allow me to stress this, the Sterato Swedish flicks beautifully. Think about this for a moment. The engineering brain trust at Lamborghini spent time making sure their dirt-first supercar can properly slide around an off-road track. Also, no hand brake needed. The car, based on what you're doing with the wheel, sets the drift up for you. All you need do is keep the throttle matted and know what to do with your hands, admittedly the tricky part. I'm still a bit amazed. I've taken a number of Subaru WRXs and STIs on dirt trails and there's a familiar characteristic at play here, only the Sterato is two or three times more potent. It's brilliant. Now comes the questions. Anything I didn't like? For a machine that naturally hangs its butt out so beautifully, on pavement the all-wheel drive hurts the subsequent drift. Two things about that. I mentioned to Reggiani and his team that they ought to do a rear-drive Sterato. They laughed at me. Second, I only ran the car in Corsa, the most track-focused of the three settings. The other two settings are Strata, Street, and Sport. The way Lamborghini does it, Corsa actually sends more torque to the front wheels, 2080, than Sport, 1090, does. So perhaps drifts in Sport will be better. I didn't get to test it, blame time, we had little, so I don't know. I already mentioned that I hate harnesses. Other than that, Lamborghini, build it. Here's a couple reasons why Santa Gata ought to put the Sterato into production. You ever driven a supercar? The singular most annoying thing is scraping the nose on everything. Even if you have a front-end lift, you're either holding up traffic waiting for it to raise, not cool, or you plumb forget, and scrape. The Sterato will never scrape. Besides, even if it does, you'd be scraping the aluminum nose guard, and scars would look cool on this particular car. Another thing, as time marches on, sports cars and supercars only get thinner tires, stiffer springs, and firmer dampers. Well, guess what? Fat sidewalls, soft springs, and relaxed dampers mean the Sterato rides better than any supercar I can think of. Yes, even the much-vaunted McLaren Super Series cars with their fancy hydraulic suspension, which, for the record, do not ride like a Rolls-Royce, no matter how much the PR flax keep repeating that claim. The Sterato also doesn't ride like a roller. But for what it is, it rides super comfy. Who wouldn't like that? Yeah, but is there a business case? Judging by the way people on my Instagram reacted to the first batch of photos, Dubai won't survive much longer without a Sterato. And yes, I can see the Middle East being a place where Lumbo's space buggy would work. Same for Russia. Australia, too. And Scandinavia. Hey man, even California, imagine one of these with a set of skis and a snowboard strapped to the roof, heading up to Mammoth or Squaw Valley. Cool, no? Utah, Colorado. British Columbia, etc. But forget about using it the right way. I fear that overthinking things will kill the Sterato as well as other 40 miles past left field ideas like it. Why? In my mind it's very difficult to predict precisely why a car will be successful. 
The Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon is quite literally designed to crawl up a rocky mountain in Austria called the Schackel, yet Southern California is by far that wonderful anachronism's largest market. An even better example is the Ford Raptor. A flying truck makes no bean-counting sense, yet the wide-body pre-runners routinely sell for over-sticker. Moreover, dealer supplies, how long a vehicle sits on the lot, are among the lowest in the industry. Now, are all the folks buying Raptors racing around Baja or jumping off dunes at Glamis? Obviously not. The Raptor, like the G-Wagon, is a vehicle people just happen to love. Remember, how the customers use a car doesn't matter. You just want people to buy them in the first place. I predict, Rich, people would plop down cash for a Storato. After the drives, and after a nice debriefing with Reggiani's team about what I'd change, tires could look tougher, the body cladding could be shaped different, needs missile launchers, etc., I was handed a phone. Lamborghini's CEO, Stefano Domenicali, was on the other end, and he wanted to know what I thought. My big points were that the Storato is too good not to build and that even though I have no details about what exactly will make up the LT version of the McLaren 720S, I almost know what it will be, all I need do is look at how the 650S evolved into the 675 LT and how the 570S became the 600 LT. I roughly know what the 992 Porsche GT3 will be like, just by sitting and thinking about it. But the Storato? A breath of fresh, much needed air in a crowded segment that's not known for its sense of humor, sense of fun let alone admitting that anything on planet Earth matters besides shaving tenths of seconds off lap times. Porsche didn't understand why people wanted a manual GT3 because it's not as quick on a track as the PDK version. Because shifting yourself is more fun. Manuals now account for more than half of US GT3 sales. Fun. A generation ago Lamborghini shocked the world, first with the Countach and then the LM002. I for one think the time has come for the house that Ferruccio built to do it all over again. Long live wild-eyed ideas that accountants are genetically predisposed to hate. As such, long live the Huracan Storato. 2020 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray, here's how we build ours. We've examined the 2020 Chevrolet Corvette Stingray six ways from Sunday, giving you the lowdown on the exterior, interior, engine, cargo areas, and more. Now, after hours of, ahem, research on the C8's configurator, we know exactly how we'd spec our ideal mid-engine Corvettes. Torch red or accelerate yellow paint. Carbon flash or black wheels. Competition seats or the more comfortable GT1 buckets. Find out how we would build our dream Corvettes below. My perfect, welcome to BNC Car Reviews channel. Lamborghini recalls new Countach because glass engine cover could go flying. The reincarnated Lamborghini Countach was recalled last week for an issue relating to the vehicle's glass engine cover, a National Highway Traffic Safety Administration filing said. Lamborghini received a field notice from an owner in Qatar on October 10, which noted that one of the Countach's four glass engine cover panels had separated from the supercar while it was on the move, a NHTSA filing said. Those glass panels sit above an electronically assisted 6.5-liter V12 engine, which provides a total powertrain output of 803 horsepower and 557 pound-feet of torque. This incident prompted Lamborghini to open an investigation, which ultimately determined that an issue with the parts supplier was to blame. More specifically, Lamborghini concluded that the fault stems from an issue with the supplier's bonding of the glass panels which could result in the panels detaching and leaving the car. The 2022 Lamborghini Countach is capable of reaching 62 miles per hour from a standstill in just 2.8 seconds, before stretching its legs all the way up to 221 miles per hour. Not exactly the sort of speeds you want involved when ill-affixed bodywork is at play. Lamborghini was unable to determine whether or not other Countach examples would suffer from the same production fault during its initial investigation. On November 10, Lamborghini's Product Safety Committee voted to launch a proactive recall for the Countach in every global market. 
that recall impacts nine owners here in the United States, with dealers expected to receive the recall details on January 9, 2023. Customers will receive a notice from Lamborghini later that week. Customer cars will be inspected after that, with replacement glass panels being made available if they are required. Every Countach built during October 2022 will already have the issue addressed in Santa Gata Bolognese. Owning an exclusive supercar can come with some unique challenges. Thankfully for the Lamborghini faithful, this particular fix should be a straightforward job. If you happen to own one of these, it's probably a good idea to leave it in the garage for the time being. Not that you are going to pour on the miles, anyway. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Mercedes will make your EV quicker. If you pay $1,200 a year, Mercedes will soon let owners of its electric EQ models unlock quicker acceleration as part of a $1,200 plus annual subscription, as first reported by The Drive. Purchased through Mercedes Me Connect services, the subscription is said to drop 0 to 60 mph times by as much as a full second. The subscription also increases the max output from the electric motors by between 60 and 87 horsepower, depending on the model. Improved performance always has a price when it comes to new cars, whether it's shelling out extra money for a mightier engine option or paying a yearly fee to hit 60 miles per hour a second sooner. Wait, what? That's right, Mercedes will soon offer an annual subscription to owners of its electric EQ models that lets them unlock additional power and quicker acceleration. It only costs $1,200 plus tax. Every year. Welcome to the future. The practice of automakers instituting a subscription model for popular features has been a growing trend. It's largely a byproduct of more and more new cars utilizing technology that allows over-the-air updates. Of course, charging consumers monthly or yearly subscription fees for content that is otherwise standard can tick people off, as BMW learned the hard way with its Apple CarPlay snafu. Still, these on-demand options don't appear to be going away anytime soon, and everyone will likely have an opinion on Mercedes's soon-to-be-released acceleration increase which is currently listed on the company's online store. So, what exactly does Mercedes dollar $1,200 plus per year performance upgrade get you? Depending on the model, it's said to reduce the EV's 0 to 60 mph time between 0.8 and 1 second. The only models the company lists are the all-wheel drive EQE 354MATIC and EQS 454MATIC in both sedan and SUV configurations. Along with quicker acceleration, Mercedes says the acceleration increase package increases the maximum output of the electric motors. Along with more torque, the EQE 350 models gained 60 horsepower, 349 total, and EQS 450 models add 87 horsepower, 443 total. It's currently not clear if the subscription-based performance upgrade is available on models other than the sedan and SUV versions of the EQE 350 and EQS 450. The Mercedes site also doesn't state when the feature can be purchased and activated and whether or not it simply requires an over-the-air software update or something hardware-related that owners will need to have a dealer handle. We reached out to Mercedes directly for clarification and we'll update this story once we hear back. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. New Off-Road Tires of SEMA 2022 Mickey Thompson Baja Boss M Slash T in 42 and 44 inch sizes Although the Mickey Thompson Baja Boss M Slash T tire design is not new to SEMA 2022 two new sizes that are key to the off-road world are new. Those sizes include a 42X 13.50R 17LT, in a C load rating, a 42X 13.50R 20LT, in a D load rating, and 44X 13.50R 20LT, in a C load rating, for those who want to run dubs, which we guess is somewhat acceptable for 42 and 44 inch tires, but just barely. We're waiting in line for a set of the 42X 13.50R 17LTs so we can test them ourselves, 
and we bet this will be a very popular size in the off-road space as it's been a while since any of the big tire companies supported any tire this size, let alone a radial. And since this tire is from Mickey Thompson you know it will perform to task. Compound and design are said to be the same as the smaller Baja Boss M-T tires which means they will work. Toyo Open Country R slash T Trail A few years back we learned about our slash T tires, or what are sometimes called hybrid terrain tires. The idea is that these tires fit in the tire world somewhere between an all-terrain tire and a mud terrain. And according to our insider information directly from Toyo, the Open Country R slash T Trail is an expansion on that idea, due to customer demand. The result is a unique new tire that fits in the Toyo line somewhere between the classic Toyo M slash T and the hybrid terrain Toyo Open Country R slash T. The Open Country R slash T trail features extra thick shoulder and sidewall lugs that are said to help dig into deep and soft terrain and provide impact and puncture resistance. Add in a rim protector, slightly less siping than the classic Open Country R slash T. Large optimized tread blocks with a three variable pitch pattern, stone ejectors, and more, and you end up with a Toyo tire that offers better off road grip than a traditional all terrain without the noise and harshness of a dedicated mud terrain. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. No public charger, no problem, some EV enthusiasts let strangers juice up at their house. One notable entry described itself as the Watt Family Poodle Farm and Insane Asylum. The Watt Place, yes, really, stands out on the plug share list, one of several unexpected private residences among the app's location and status reviews of public EV chargers. To find out who is inviting total strangers to their garage and why, photographer Michael Simari and I nabbed the key fob to an electric car we figured wouldn't be too unwelcome in any driveway a BMW i4 M50, and charted a course along the west coast of Michigan, marking our stops based on PlugShare's little blue house icons. Our first destination was a complex of tiny homes a few miles from the beach in South Haven, where, with no answers to our in-app texts, we pulled up in front of a charging Chrysler Pacifica and clumsily asked a woman sitting on the nearby patio if we could borrow some charge. I'm sorry, what, she said, looking confused. Can we plug into your charging station? You're listed on the PlugShare map. Her eyes widened, and she started laughing. Oh my gosh, yes, of course. I'm sorry, I forgot we were on there. Nobody ever uses it. While the BMW slowly collected electrons, we asked the appropriately named Heather Wire, yes, really, why she and her husband offer energy from their vacation home to any passing road tripper. When we installed the charger a few years ago, there weren't many public ones, and we wanted to support the technology and push green energy. It's not that much electricity, it's not a big deal to share it. Our next stop was in Holland, the Michigan one, home to two listings. The first address was down a driveway so long and winding that it cost us another mile of range. It ended at a gorgeous house with no sign of a place to plug in and every sign of a place where you'd get arrested for trespassing. Go knock on the door, suggested Simari. You go knock, I answered. Neither of us did. If you live in a beautiful house in Holland and are wondering about the two minutes of ring camera footage of two people arguing in a BMW, sorry, that was us. A few blocks away was a cute yellow duplex, again with no visible charging station and no sign that anyone was home. We dithered about the etiquette of knocking for so long that a neighbor came out and asked if we needed help, in the do I need to call the police about you, kind of way. We explained that we'd been sent by a charging network app, and he smiled forgivingly and suggested a nearby grocery store. We tried once more, in a rougher neighborhood near Muskegon, one with gangs of wild turkeys strutting around overgrown lawns. The address had a Chevy Bolt in the driveway but no obvious charging capability. Feeling guilty about chickening out on the last two, I knocked on a peeling white door with a broken pane of glass. No answer, and I was glad. We gave up and used some of our remaining 40 miles to get to a public charge point unit. 
Both plugs were in use, one by a Volkswagen ID.4, the other a Polestar. The Polestar driver showed up a few minutes later, and we claimed the open slot just before a Hyundai Kona Electric and a Ford Mustang Mach-E joined the parking lot party. The driver of the Kona checked the charge on the VW, 100%, and ranted about the rudeness of the owner. The Kona owners were on vacation and had been on the road for a month. They said that while charging was never a big problem, there were occasionally inconveniences like the inconsiderate VW owner. Despite that, they felt the hurdles of EV ownership were worth it, repeating an idea Heather Wire had expressed, that electric car owners are testing something new, an idea still in its infancy. The next morning I had several messages. Some were apologies from folks with vacation homes who weren't around on weekdays. Several were from people who said they no longer had an EV or had moved and didn't remember they were on the app. Two offered their electricity. The first was down a gravel road running the peninsula of Arcadia Lake. I battled spiders on the charging cord while Samari enjoyed the view. Later I spoke to the owner, Paul Warnick. Like the wires, Warnick is an early adopter of electrified vehicles, buying first a Volt and then a Bolt. His shared plug makes sense, being out in a remote area, and he says he gets three to five users a year, usually guests of his neighbors. Part of it is just to encourage others to consider it. I feel lucky I can do that. It's a small thing, and it's a way to give back. To recharge, but we had one more stop to make, Tim Drager's house, in a neighborhood built around a private airstrip. The Dragers bought a Bolt on the recommendation of a friend who worked for GM. They like the low maintenance of the EV and feel like it makes up for doing much of their travel by plane. I burn a lot of fossil fuels. This feels like a little carbon offset, said Drager. He added what by now had become a common refrain, I like meeting the people in the EV community. The network isn't here yet, but it's growing. We're pioneers. Like trailblazers and friendly outposts along the Oregon Trail, people like Drager, The Wires, and Warnick offer some emergency rations in the wilderness. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Polestar 2 BST Edition 270 Echoes Polestar's Past Before Polestar became Volvo's all-electric offshoot brand, it was the Swedish carmaker's racing and performance division. Perhaps in a bid to regain some of that sporty personality, there's a new limited production model, the 2023 Polestar 2 BST Edition 270. With the dual-motor Polestar 2 as a starting point, the 270 in the name refers to the worldwide production run. The BST is a nod to its internal beast development code. For the $76,900 starting price, the BST is essentially a Polestar 2 with the optional Pilot, Plus, and Performance Pack options. According to Polestar's online configurator, adding these options to a non-BST model takes the price to $66,400. The BST's power output of 469 horsepower and 502 pound-feet of torque is the same as the Performance Packs, as are the upgraded Brembo brakes. The EV guts are also carryovers, with a lithium-ion battery pack that has a 75.0 kWh usable capacity and DC fast charging up to a 155 kW rate. Range drops slightly though, from an EPA-estimated 260 miles down to 247 miles. The BST's price premium is justified with exclusive add-ons that include 21-inch forged wheels with bespoke Pirelli P0s, a front strut bar, a 1-inch lower ride height, painted body cladding, and black mirrors. The big news is the inclusion of special Alain's dampers that are two-way adjustable up front. To see if those upgrades paid off, we had the opportunity to ring out the BST on the Bay Area Skyline Boulevard, an abstract scribble of pavement famed for slicing through the redwoods. Within the first few blocks heading out of Burlingame, California, it's clear the BST's ride quality is firmer than the standard Polestar 2 with the performance pack. You definitely feel the impacts from ruts in the pavement, but only large potholes cause any real harshness. 
the smaller bumps are adequately smoothed over thanks in large part to the Olin's damper's dual flow valving that allows for distinct behaviors for low and high speed compression events. It's similar to how progressive springs can add some initial compliance for comfort and stability while also having greater resistance when cornering hard. The difference is that the Olin's dampers are more easily adjustable to suit your tastes. The coilover spring preloads are also manually adjustable with the right tools. Polestar's Christian Sampson, head of product attributes, informed us that our BST was set to 7 on the adjustment scale of 1 to 22, with 1 being the firmest and 22 the softest. That potentially leaves a lot more compliance for everyday comfort and a bit more firmness for a track day. Though the 127 miles per hour top speed will limit how much fun you can have on the straightaways. As we find our way to Skyline Boulevard, the suspension begins to shine. You feel a strong connection to the BST and the Pirelli's contact patches with every nudge of the steering wheel, though the steering effort seems too light for spirited driving. In typical EV fashion, Having the batteries below the floor masks a lot of the small hatchback seat slash D estimated 4,700 pound curb weight. It's easy to get acclimated to the BST's handling characteristics, and in no time we're pushing harder and harder into each consecutive turn. Larger undulations in the road can cause some alarming hops, though. The Polestar BST is as entertaining and lively as the BMW i4 and the lack of synthetic motor noises gives it a more zen-like experience. You hear the tires squeal and turns and whimper when you're hard on the brakes. They give a very good indication of how much harder you can drive in a delightfully old-school analog manner. We executed a very subtle four-wheel slide in one bend and were pleased with how intuitive and effortless it was to manage. There weren't any snap releases from adhesion, nor was there any need for any rally car histrionics by sawing away at the wheel. Like a gold medal gymnast, it just stuck the landing. Point, the BST was also well-mannered on slick roads. Mid-corner bumps were barely acknowledged, and there was still an abundance of grip to keep charging with more aggression than most drivers would consider sensible. There's no doubt that the BST is a very different beast compared to the Polestar 2. It's a hardcore version for the few who are willing to sacrifice some comfort for cornering excellence. It's as good a dance partner as the i4, and its interior is noticeably nicer than that of a Tesla Model 3. With most EVs taking the SUV route, there are few sporty alternatives that don't cost as much as a Porsche Taycan or an Audi e-tron GT. Unfortunately, if you're interested in a new Polestar 2 BST, you're out of luck as all of the 270 examples have been spoken for. And that begs the question of why Polestar greenlights such a limited production run. It seems likely that the BST is testing the waters for a more serious performance EV in the future. If that ends up being realized, we'll be pacing with nervous anticipation. It's impressive that the BST is able to extract so much more handling prowess from the existing Polestar 2 and bodes well for a purpose-built performance model. Fian Design Porsche 911 Restomod is no backup singer. We must wait for the day when automotive artisans reimagine third-gen Camaros or Fox-bodied Mustangs into immaculate carbon-fiber-bodied Restomods that command six-figure prices. Until then, we'll have to keep slumming with the 964 generation of the Porsche 911. Of course, there are plenty of reasons why the penultimate air-cooled 911 is the frequent muse for high-end tuning outfits. There is no shortage of cars to start with, Porsche having sold more than 60,000 of all variants globally between 1989 and 1994. Interest and values are also high enough to find a market for expensive transformations. The most famous recreator of the 964 is undoubtedly Singer in California, which has been producing versions that cross the boundary from car to automotive art for more than a decade. But an increasing number of other shops are now getting into the same space. Last year, we told you about an EV version produced by Everetai in the UK, although we struggled to see what the electric powertrain added to the experience. Now here's another British firm, but this one sticks with internal combustion. 
The small shop is called Theon Design, and it gave C slash D the chance to experience a partially carbon fiber bodied 964 just before it was shipped to a buyer in Chile, hence the car's Chi 001 name. Oh, and that customer is a successful blueberry farmer, if you're wondering about the reason for its violently violet color scheme. As with many similar businesses, Theon Design was born from a personal passion, in this case, the quest of a man named Adam Hawley to build his own perfect 964 while working 9 to 5 as a car designer for big auto companies including Jaguar Land Rover. The car was eventually finished to a standard that had friends and acquaintances asking him to create something similar for them, leading to the establishment of Theon Design with business partner Lucinda Argy, who is also his wife. While the Theon Chi 001 shares its basic form with the 964, its detailing is clearly inspired by that of earlier 911s. It has lost the full-width rear light bar it was built with and gained both 930 turbo-style bumper overriders and headlamp bezels. The original car underneath the conversion was a Carrera for sold in Japan, but it has been stripped to component parts and completely rebuilt. Structural changes include a carbon fiber roof, trunk lid, engine cover, and spoiler. The fenders and bumpers are made from a sturdier carbon Kevlar blend. Weight saving over a regular 964 is around 220 pounds, according to Hawley, with the part composite bodywork also making the car stronger. Up close, the attention to detail is close to obsessive, including touches such as the symmetric mounting of the twin ignition coils on the engine firewall and the invisible integration of a center, high-mounted brake light into the rear window surround. Theon's customers have a choice of powertrains, including the intriguing option of a supercharger conversion the company has developed for the air-cooled flat six. The Qi 001 is running a naturally aspirated 4.0-liter engine, Individual throttle bodies and careful internal balancing take peak output to 400 horsepower at 7,100 rpm. It has also lost its original all-wheel drive system, and power is now sent exclusively to the rear axle through a 6-speed 993 generation gearbox and a limited slip differential. Not every part of the experience has been updated. Getting in, we find the familiar, slightly offset driving position, and although beautifully rec-rimmed in a vibrant hue to match the exterior paint, the cabin's basic architecture is unchanged. But starting the engine reveals an immediately different character to a regular Carrera of this generation. First, the bark of the exhaust, which switchable acoustic flaps vary from loud to very loud. Second is the immediacy of the engine's responses to even slight accelerator pedal pressure, thanks to an ultralight flywheel. Comparing Theon's car with a regular 964 is made complicated by the increasingly distant memories of what the original car was like when new, but this one drives with a level of poise and precision it seems hard to imagine that any stock 964 possessed even when factory fresh, with the possible exception of the famous RS variant. The Qi 001 steering feels direct and slack-free for an air-cooled 911. It retains hydraulic assistance, but this is now powered by an electric pump. Revised suspension geometry, stiffer bushings, and active dampers increase the precision with which the front end can be placed, although they also mean there is less sense of the 964's fundamental rear-biased weight distribution in corners. Easing the accelerator with the chassis loaded up tightens the line progressively but not snappily. The biggest dynamic difference is probably down to the modern Michelin Pilot Sport PS2S mounted on the period Fuchs style rims, which give an abundance of grip. The ride is firm even with the adaptive dampers in their softest setting, but not uncomfortably so. Yet the engine is the Qi 001 starring feature, impressively muscular low down but with what feels like an inexhaustible appetite for revs that the scalpel sharp accelerator encourages a driver to exploit. The tachometer only goes to 8000 rpm, but the limiter is actually another 500 rpm beyond that. Working against just 2570 pounds, it feels 21st century fast, too. 
The gear shift is perfectly weighted, and despite the switch to carbon ceramic brakes, the middle pedal feels similarly natural in its responses. This love story may have you question our critical faculties, but the car does have some downsides. The first is the price. While considerably short of the seven-figure expenditure required for one of Singer's pixel-perfect offerings, a buyer will still need to pay Theon around $500,000, at current exchange rates, to get something similar to this car, plus the cost of the donor 911. The second is the weight, the company already has a substantial order bank it needs to work its way through and can build at no more than five cars a year. Welcome to BNC Car Reviews Channel. Steve McQueen's bullet movie Mustang suddenly reappeared, this is how it happened. Steve McQueen's Highland Green 1968 Ford Mustang GT Fastback vanished 38 years ago. The ominous-looking pony car with the barking 390-cubic-inch V8, which starred in one of the greatest chase scenes in movie history in the film Bullet, with McQueen doing the driving in many of the shots, may have been lost, but it was never forgotten. Certainly not by Mustang aficionados, who speculated on its whereabouts for almost four decades, titillated by the occasional internet post or word of a spectral sighting. So when the bullet Mustang suddenly appeared at a Ford press preview at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit on January 14, 2018, the assembled journalists, car nuts, Ford execs, and Mustang fans went full geek. The synchronicity of the car's breaking cover in the same year as the Bullet movie's 50th anniversary, and at the same event where Ford revealed its 2019 Mustang Bullet tribute model, the third since 2001, is just too perfect for it to have been happenstance. And yet it largely was. As those involved tell it, the Bullet Mustang never would have resurfaced in Detroit had it not been for a coincidence of cosmic proportions, the sheer luck of fortuitous timing, and, especially, the efforts of a determined coterie of emotionally invested volunteers. It took 30 seconds for the Bullet Mustang, in original, if dilapidated, condition, to rumble onto the stage at Detroit's Cobo Center, but it took a village to make it happen. The Backstory The movie car's trip to the auto show stand actually started in earnest in December 2000.